Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Mind Heist, episode 87, with myself, Amin, and Allah Yashri Muhammad. <laughs> you got the shirt on today, yeah? The button up. Oh, it's the thobe, bro. Oh, I got the thobe. Where do you I buy them we... from? I don't think I've. Tunisia. I think I've only ever bought one thobe or two. Oh, they're all I've gifts. got loads. Yeah, I've got loads of uh, just gifts. Mm. Mm. So this one, um, God, it's going to be very rude of me not to remember who bought me this one, but I don't know. Someone must have bought me this one. Mm. Uh, it might have been my mum. I'm not sure. May Allah reward them. Uh, me. Man, I haven't worn thobe in a long time because I usually wear them to go out. In the house, um, it's just the material's a bit hot. I don't know why. Really? Like outside, outside it's fine, even though it's hot outside. I don't know. It, it, but when I'm sitting, it, it's like, you know, when you're wearing a suit, it's yeah. like, it's not that comfortable. It's not like relaxed kind of thing, right? For me, so if I'm going to the masjid, I'm in and out going to the masjid, then I'll wear it. And usually what I'll do is I won't actually wear the thobe in the house. I'll, I'll, I'll just have like what I'm wearing under the thobe. And then when I go out, I'll just drop it on and I'll go out yeah. like that. But because the masjid are pretty much closed, um, just haven't been wearing them for that reason, to be honest. I'm the opposite. If I wear them anywhere, I probably wear them at home. Don't yeah. really ever wear one but, out. Yeah, the style you've got is like the casual style. I don't have mm. those. Mm. Um, I get the long sleeve ones and all that. Like this, the pure white ones. Um, I've got one white, I've got grey, I've got um, beige, a couple yeah. of beige ones. Um, but yeah, I like, I like the, I think it's Kuwaiti style one, where it's got a collar, but it's a small collar. Like the one you've right. got, actually. You like that one pretty much. A bit, maybe mine a bit are, smaller than that. Mine are all short sleeves. Like every single one I've got is a short sleeve mm. one, I think. Yeah. Um, my, my, uh, my partner, Mohammed, he came, uh, he was in the UAE, um, this was a long time ago, where we were setting up the, registering the business here. And, you know, we registered the business and then we went to the bank to open a bank account. And he always wears thobes, okay? Like he has not, he's never not worn a thobe out for years, five years, 10 right. years, I don't know, yeah, a long time. And, um, and he wears like short sleeve ones or he wears like the uh, North African style ones, which are also short sleeve. And I was like, bro, like, you know, that, that style is like, considered pajamas over here like it's not a good look to walk into a oh, bank no. with that and he's like what do you mean and stuff <laughs> he oh, didn't no. he didn't really know about that but i was yeah. like yeah man don't don't do that <laughs> oh, no. but yeah in um uh, even in north africa though like i guess it depends where but some people's attitude is like if you wear a thobe it's because you're lazy like you just want something to throw on uh whereas, yeah, maybe. yeah in the khalid or whatever it's like i guess your normal um day wear it's pretty formal in a way um but yeah in north africa it's like but that's some that is the way some people wear it in uh algeria it's it's literally like lazy man style yeah it's like yeah uh, not bothered kind of thing yeah that's, that's definitely me bro lazy and not bothered <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's but that's why they're considered house things, I suppose, because it's like yeah. uh, for the home and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Actually, before I wanted to get in the question, I've got a question for you, yeah, because okay. you're such a connoisseur of uh, of clothing and design and style, fashion. Oh, yeah, okay. the high fashion guy, yeah, um, yeah okay. the yellow hoodie guy. Um, yeah, bro. So you know, like me, like the way I am on the podcast, the way I do my videos, blah blah blah, writing the book, all of that, yeah. What yeah. do you think would be like uh, a dress sense or dress type of clothes that would suit that persona? If I was going to create, because if you want to take branding seriously, you need some level of consistency in everything, right? The way you yeah. sound, the way you look on camera, the way your photos are done and the way you dress as well, right? And your branding and your colors and all that. So what would suit my style, I suppose? I suppose it'd be like um kind of like the mark zuckerberg look <laughs> really? you know yeah so just have like if you're wearing t-shirts and you'd have like maybe the same t-shirt in a few sort of 
Okay, minimalist vibe. Yeah, yeah, quite minimalist. Like, mm. just don't detract the focus from anything other than what you're trying to project. Mm, um, okay, because what you're trying to promote is more valuable than how you may appear, or do you know what I mean? Like, mm. um, it's that sort of tech CEO kind of look. Um, <laughs> you're not like a meme, you know. You don't want to be like a meme. I'll give you a comparison. Like, if you compare like Steve Jobs. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, I don't know, CEO of Google, all these people, mm. they're quite, they seem to be quite, not plain, but, oh yeah, in a way plain, but nothing wrong with plain. Yeah. Like compare that to like e- Elon Musk, for example, he's a bit of a, he's a bit of a loud person. I mean, he's not, his personality isn't loud, but like the way he presents himself, the stuff he does is quite bombastic. Yeah. And even like, if you look at the way he dresses, it's mm. not set. It's not defined like all the others are. Mm. Um, so yeah, it depends what kind of. But I think mm. for yourself, if it reflects your personality and it reflects what you're mm. trying to deliver, it's so it's basically having... it's a look which reflects. Let my let my work speak for me. I'm not gonna like yeah. my my clothes won't speak for me. But don't you think that would make me? I guess it, I was thinking that would make me forgettable in the sense where it's like I look plain, but. I suppose it, it's not forgettable because we like, like you're mentioning, like Mark Zuckerberg is known for that look. Yeah. But at the same time, like, mm. I don't know. I've, I, I, I've come from maybe trying to be really out there to not, not trying to be, but like some of my decisions in dress and stuff has been like that. And now I'm, I don't know. I'm just not that interested in that anymore. Um, now it's just, I don't really want any attention on myself. So, um, Try and just blend in, but I suppose you don't want to be a target for anything. Like you, you don't want to with with a lot of work, especially Islamic work, and especially stuff with a, a greater purpose. I, f- I feel like you want to push your work to the forefront, and then let that be the topic of conversation, as opposed to anything to do with you. Mm. Um, you don't want people to just make you into a personality. You don't want this thing to be about you. You want it to be a, a legacy that others can even like sort of um you might even it might be something that actually okay, you, you you produce something and then someone else reads your book thinks oh i can improve on this makes it better and then you they reiterate on what you've done and that'd be good for you to see and then you can keep that going because i think for you it's you want to start this conversation but you also want to you have a greater purpose for it as opposed to it just being associated to you all the time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's good not to put yourself too much out there as the, the king of X, like the king of this industry. It's better instead to, and I guess this is how the process was. It's like, okay, I'm the messenger here and I'm, but I'm like on a very humble, right? I'm the messenger. Uh, I'm be, being given this guidance from Allah. Uh, and even the Prophet Sallallahu is saying, right, that, oh, I am, uh, is it, what's the hadith uh, about, I am the best of you and I'm the best to my wives or something like that, right? Yeah. So yeah. he's saying I am the best, right? Um, yeah. And obviously he, we still know that that's not said in a arrogant way, that's a humble way. But yeah. the thing that the key thing about the Prophet is that he was happy to give other people authority and other people leadership positions and yeah. all of that. So that's what's nice where you build a platform uh, for 10 years, 20 years, but you build it in a way so you can hand the baton on to someone else or to multiple people. Yeah. And so it's not about you, it's about the, the mission and the message and whatever. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ did with the with the Sahaba, and that's proven in the way that the Ummah continued after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. Mm-hmm. The Khulafa Rashidin and uh, amazing characters, man, amazing characters. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that that is what I'm thinking. Like I was even thinking that uh, one of the materials I would like to put out is some kind of structure or curriculum if you like for anybody that wants to do a weekly halaqa with young men for example like yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. and they don't even have to attribute it to me or anything it's just you know take it here it is kind of yeah. thing uh, that would be really good you yeah. know there's something like i I've, I've it's all about what you can sort of give people a value i suppose i've, I've been thinking a lot about that recently i'm, I'm trying to think of like because we've all got skills 
we've all got things where like we both we both ended up on some uh, i don't i don't know what his actual name is to be honest i've forgotten his real name but it was on his facebook where he a brother wrote about he's i think how old is he 25 or so and he doesn't feel like he's good at anything oh okay yeah yeah because i commented and then you commented on yeah yeah yeah. we're, we're both i essentially said to him like you're probably okay at something that you just haven't chose to focus on yes you know? yeah and the same with i think you you sort of echoed that maybe i just copied sort of you bro. Oh. <laughs> 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 but, <laughs> but it's, it's 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 looking back at what i do it's like i've tried so many different things since i was a teenager mm. um and i've always been i'd argue relatively okay at the stuff that i've done mm. and then it's like like I've, I've, you know, I've done, I've done, I've done YouTube before, and I was okay at that. Actually, we did quite well on YouTube, like yeah. YouTube Dower back in the day. Mm. Um, I'd done um, video editing way before that, like early, way before I was even practicing. I was really good at that. Mm. Um, and in way, I'm, even, I'm, you know, there was other things I did before as well that were all in this creative field. And I did obviously the clothing stuff, and I was okay at that. And then graphic design or Photoshop or whatever, another thing that. I was okay at, um, mm. and it isn't until recently that I just thought, okay, let me focus on that because I enjoy that. I something I can, you know, something that you're not rushed to learn. You can just do it at your own pace, sort of thing. But yeah, everybody's got something. I think it depends what kind of personality you have. Um, do you lose interest in things quickly? Do you lack a passion for it? Like everybody's got their ups and downs. It's like what the Nabi Sallam said about. Each moment, each thing that you do, you set to do has like it's. Um, I'm really paraphrasing it here, but it has its like moment of tenacity where, like, the fire is quite lit and you're quite ambitious in doing it, and then sometimes you're not. Mm. Um, like I sat down yesterday to create another poster or something and couldn't for the life of like I sat there for like 20 minutes and I just couldn't think of where to start. I gave up. <laughs> mm. um, whilst other days it would just flow naturally. Um, yeah, what was ultimately saying? I was, I can't remember what the ultimate point was. I think about you're talking about saying. focusing, right? Yeah, it's just, um, yeah, just focusing because, like you said about, you know, clothing and myself and personality that I have. Oh, I think someone's trying to um, enter the room. No, nope, he's gone. Um, <laughs> I've sort of shifted that now because i just don't see the point anymore i think because of a lot of stuff that's happened in life like mm-hmm. i don't see any fundamental benefit in spending too much on money uh too much on clothes sorry uh and going beyond the, the necessities for something that is only like it, the impact that your clothing has on somebody is only really the brief first impression it doesn't change how the people that always know you or have known you for ages really view you mm. you know in, in a long-term impactful way um for example if you meet someone for the first time what you wear shapes what they assume of you so like their initial and this is the way i see it like it's, it's all about social dynamics like if you meet someone for the first time and they're dressed in all sports gear for example then your initial impression is oh this person is someone who works out you know, mm. however, if you met me, I mean, if you, you know, we came to the UK for a holiday or something and I was dressed in all sports gear, you probably wouldn't even, it wouldn't even cross your mind. Like what I am, it doesn't change who you think I am as a person that much. Mm. Um, so I think, yeah, first impressions count. Mm. If you're going somewhere and you you want to make a good first impression, then yeah, of course, dress nicely. Mm-hmm. Obviously always look presentable because that's our dean uh, to look presentable and to be clean and to be hygienic, etc. But I don't think it should uh, it should burn out people's brain cells too much. Like, yeah, there's people there's people that don't leave the house uh, on time because they're too sort of you know going crazy about what to wear and don't yeah, have an yeah. outfit. That is just... Yeah. Good night, Boba. <laughs> I think it's interesting, bro. Um, Good night. What? Like not necessarily uh, choosing what to wear every day, but just having yeah. whatever you wear. Um, the the impression that it can build upon, I guess this is more for people who have some kind of uh, popularity, some kind of uh, audience or whatever. Like I'm yeah. thinking, yeah. So uh, like Sheikh Ali Hamouda, you know Ali Hamouda, yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah, so he will often 
wear a thobe, but then you'll see him sometimes wearing, you know, a jumper, wearing this and that. Yeah. Right? So that gives a certain vibe. Like I, I actually never met him. I met him once in Hajj. I, yeah. uh, that was the only time I ever met him. And from that, I actually got a feeling because he, obviously Hajj, he was uh, wearing a thobe and, uh, it was formal kind of thing, right? I could tell he's not that old, but it is a formal yeah. thing, right? But then I saw other videos where he's being a bit more playful and then he's wearing other clothes. And so now my image of his, him is different. But like you said, that's somebody I don't know that well. But also I, mm. I do feel like it will have an impact like uh, other ways, like, like Sheikh Haytham, you'll never see him without a thobe. And it's not the fact that he's wearing a thobe, it's the fact that a thobe, you know, a long sleeve thobe with the collar and all that, it's a formal piece of clothing you know yeah. also uh Sheikh Hamza Yusuf like if you see him I saw some po photos of him recently he's wearing like uh because obviously he's white right so maybe he feels like you know I'm not, not necessarily gonna wear a thobe but he wears like a proper like shirt waistcoat jacket like it's, mm. it's almost like he's coming from 1800s America kind of thing yeah, yeah. um but these kind of if you, if I don't know if he wears that day in day out or whatever, but I, I do think that will, even amongst people you know, it'll have some kind of impression. Some, and so, it is. It's interesting to think of how you want to be seen in that way. And I think yeah. even among friends, it will, it will give off that impression with them. You know, because, I mean? yeah. If, if if it's combined with, it has to be obviously combined with a personality. Issue. Yeah, exactly. Like it has to be one real. great one brother that I will. I want to big up in his absence is um, uh, Musa, you know, Musa Adnan. Um, mm. So I've known him since he was around 16 and um, you know, he's been, he's done to try different things and, and whatever. And, and as of recently, he's really, really um, taken a deep sort of dive into the Quran and really made that his priority, mm -hmm. you know, studying the Quran with um, Ustad Jamal um, really sort of like that's just what he likes to talk about when i'm with him like that's what he wants to talk about that's what he mm -hmm. and and his his demeanor has completely transformed in my opinion anyway mm -hmm. he he's, he's he's become a lot softer a lot more focused um he doesn't don't hear him like laughing hysterically you know like we used to when we were younger and stuff mm -hmm. like that like but on top of that he's he's always like thobed up got a hat like a goofy or something on and that's how he presents himself now. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's this, you can tell the impact that his teacher has had on him mm. um, to the point where he's, you know, I'd, I'd argue he's emulating his teacher a little bit in the way he conducts himself, the way he dresses. And yeah. his teacher's phenomenal. Actually. Like Usted Jamal, like I remember when I first met Usted Jamal, that he walks into a room and the atmosphere just changes. He's just one of those people that um, mm. really, really powerful um, aura that he gives off mm -hmm. just for, just the way that, I think it's something that the Quran does. It honors you in that way. Definitely. Because I didn't know much about him until I'd met him. And um, they were saying, oh, you know, Akhi, he's memorized all of this and he knows the qira'at, all of these qira'at, et cetera, et cetera, and this and that. Mm. Um, but yeah, so the impact of those that you, you respect and those that you hold mm. dear to you um, are really what... And I think that's another thing with fashion. Like, if you don't like, I'd argue maybe you're a bit similar to me. Like you don't have anyone, like a group of people that you're close to. Like I remember when I was here, when I was like 17, 18, I, was, I spoke about this before. I was very highly influenced by the group that I was in, mm -hmm. in the sense that the group I was in was wearing designer clothing. So I would try to compete or imitate that or whatever and purchase the same sort of things. Now that I'm extremely detached from that and I'm also detached from uh, anyone who would care <laughs> that I'm not, I haven't got this drive to really focus on what, yeah. you know, what's hot yeah. in fashion, what's yeah. aware, what, what I care about mm. in that sense. So but I think the, uh, ul the ultimate and the best way to be about kind of how you dress, how you present yourself is that you're ultimately doing it for yourself because you want this to be your identity for yourself. Yeah. And, you know, and that's why like, I don't know, just a small thing, but like, when I, I stopped wearing short sleeve stuff outside yeah. um, because I just, I thought, you know, even if it's a t-shirt, but it's long sleeve, it does give off a bit more of a formal thing. And it's like, really? you know, I want to be uh, serious, right? Not obviously it's not the same as the guy that goes out in the three piece suit and all of that. 
but it's some level, right? It's, a, it's I guess, yeah. a balance between a little bit of formality and um, uh, what's it called? And, and it's casual, you know, because you know, I'm, I am a casual guy in the end, to be honest with you. Um, I, I don't know, you know, you said about having the Mark Zuckerberg look. I think for me, it's a bit, it's a bit too casual. It's a bit informal, uh, which yeah. might make you approachable, but somewhere between that and like something a bit serious, you know, that's, I guess, the way I'd like to be perceived, not for the sense of what, you know, what people will think of me maybe, but uh, what will get the best impact, right? So it depends who, you, who you're trying to um, relate to, okay? So yeah. if I'm trying to relate to, for example, uh, young men, you know, 15 to 25, then I think that is where you want to be, where it's like you're more formal than them, but you're less formal than, you know, the 35-year-old corporate guy or whatever, you know? Yeah. That's, That's cool. where you want to be. Okay, bro. Uh, should we go to questions? Uh, should we start with an email? Let me see what we've got. Uh, so the most recent Amani says, a uh, pretty long one. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. So this was sent, you know, <laughs> a couple months ago. Let's just say that. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Really enjoy the perspective your podcast brings. Just some thoughts on episode 60. This doesn't need to be addressed specifically, but just, just food for thought. So I believe this was um, the episode, something to do with, maybe it was the one, uh, Women's Role in Society. Let me just take a quick look for us. I think mm -hmm. that was the one. So 60, wow, that was quite a few episodes ago. Yeah, Women's Role in Muslim Society. Um, so she says, uh, I, am, I am or hope to be com a committed Muslim woman who aims to preserve her deen to my utmost ability. I was listening to your podcast episode and I agree with everything Islam recommends as Allah's wisdom is perfection. But if I give the opinion or thoughts of my group of friends, we are all practicing Muslims graduated from, from healthcare degree pharmacy. Before even deciding what to study and at uni, most practicing girls look at what career is family friendly and safe for women, etc. So I would say 75% chose female dominated careers. Okay, nice. Um, to avoid the riba and our parents, uh, to avoid the riba, our parents paid 36K of uni fees. That's a hefty sum and spent five years in uni slash training. So it would seem a waste really to not make use of the qualification. We understand the need for segregation and look for environments where this is a minimum, uh, for example, hospital or pharmacy. Um, I woke, I work in a very white area of the UK and our department has say 50 staff, not more than 10 are men. Once we are married and have children, no doubt we want to stay at home and enjoy raising children, etc. And so we all have this mindset of working before children to get yourself up the ladder. And it's not selfish because it's a caring job. You're working for the NHS, so it's hardly any money. It's not a money-making business. But it's just so when you get to having kids, you're able to take a career ladder, uh, a career break. And if needs be kids are older, you have time, etc. You can work part time, you have that luxury, not in terms of money, but as in you'll be able to have the skills and experience to be able to get back. In terms of volunteering, which I agree. So let's just deal with that, what's been said so far, then we'll move on. Because it's quite long. Um, what do you think, bro? I think, um, I think what was what's the danger of us talking about it before is that it was people would perceive that as like a definitive this is what should be done sort of mm -hmm. position um whilst my stance if i can clarify is that my stance or my opinion is my opinion however it does not detract from people's different situations circumstances and how they perceive um you know the world that we live in i mean the situation that oh where's everything gone that was weird. Oh, right. Yeah. The situation that my family may be in is completely different to, you know, the sisters or other people, you know, and other Muslims in the world. And what is a necessity for me and my family is not a necessity for them and vice versa. Um, so honestly, like uh, my, in my opinion, if, if that's something that they believe is necessary and, and beneficial and, um, you know, it's going to benefit them in, in this dunya and the akhirah, then mm. by all means, go for it. Like, and if you can minimize, ultimately, whatever, like just because you've got a job, just because you don't have a job, sorry, doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're um, what's the word? Maximizing your potential. And it also doesn't mean that just because you have a job or you've got, um, like, let's say you're, for example, I'm at work, 
doesn't mean that everything I do because I'm a man, I'm at work means that everything I'm putting in is halal. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like a, a man has to equally uh, navigate the halal haram as much yes. as a woman does in terms of the, you know, the work environment, stuff like that. And mm-hmm. I think men, I think it's easy for men in the positions that we're in, just because we assume that women shouldn't be working. You know, at least some men do. They assume all women should be working. It doesn't mean that we forget the responsibility that we have and, and what we can and can't do in our workplace. And yeah. do we speak up for what we believe we can like, you know, do we speak up to our managers and bosses and whatever you want to call them, supervisors in terms of, oh, I need to pray at this time or I can't work with this person or I have to do this. Do you know what I mean? Um, and yeah, it is a headache. And ultimately, ultimately, any if you can work in a Muslim environment, that's better. If you can work, if you have some sort of employment or income where you're more reliant upon yourself, for example, you've got your own business, you sell something, you provide some sort of service or whatever, that's great. Um, I think it's just difficult. It's I think it is going to be more difficult for women on the long run. However, everyone is judged, you know, separately to, to their sort of situation. So mm. focus on that, inshallah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I probably... Uh, you know, we we made that episode a few, you know, several months back, and I probably would stand by what I said there. But what's important is for us to uh, be clear on what, like, what we were trying to say as a fundamental point that we we would like to get across, and what are some things which are more kind of depending on the context, like you said. And one thing mm-hmm. that is fundamental that I would communicate is that what is the objective here, right? So if mm-hmm. the objective is uh, I think we talked about like making money as as one reason maybe to work, right? Like ultimately, what I'm trying to say is if you if you if you don't need to work, right? So which should be the case for, for you know ideally it should be the case for all Muslim women that you don't need to work, right? Now, if that's your situation, inshallah, then if you are going to work, it should be for the sake of Allah, it should be for a good reason, right? And when you're doing something for the sake of Allah, then you're not gonna force yourself into that position if it's not if it's a quite a big compromise right so for example i think it's great what she's saying you know she's saying that we are uh, we're, we're going into korea specifically based on are they uh, women friendly or are they you know relatively halal good environments mm-hmm. um that's great that's what should be happening and then when she said about you know, we would like to, you know, work a little bit. So then when we have kids, we're going to be focusing on the kids, but then later on, we might want to go back into that. So why, why, so you're working before you have kids so that later in life, when the kids are older, you can go back into it. So all I would ask is why do you want to go back into it? Why, why do you want to be, because that's why you're doing all this, right? That's why you're going to uni, you're paying 36 K. Mm. Um, then you're working for a bit before inshallah, you get married, have kids and all that. So that at some point you could go back into it. So now why do you want to go back into it? If it's for mm. the sake of Allah and you're really thinking, okay, what do I want to do in my life? What's my contribution going to be on this planet? It could be that I want to take care of people, which is, uh, you know, something that, you know, yeah. women have a more, uh, what's the word? They lean, they're, they're more uh, equipped in many ways to be that caring kind of person then that's great. And you're doing it for the sake of life, trying to do, you know, whoever saves a life, like they save mankind. That is the thing. That is the objective. So now you're going into at least with that objective of pleasing Allah. Um, mm. Whereas if you're doing it for other reasons and there's compromises, then it's another thing. But I just wanted to put forward that fundamental point that why are you doing it? And I, I think a big, another big point I was trying to make there on that episode was that women shouldn't be pressured and forced to work. A women, mm. Muslim women should have the choice, ideally, you know, um, where the, the, if, they're, if they're not um, going to have, don't have a job per se, there shouldn't be pressure, there shouldn't be uh, peer pressure, shouldn't be shame in that. Um, I, maybe there should be shame in doing not much else, okay, like not having a job, yeah. but, then, but then not having kids, but then not really doing any, maybe there should be shame in that, right? But yeah. um, there shouldn't be pressure to get a job for job's sake. There should be pressure to do something for the sake of Allah, you know? So anyway, that's just a... It could be, though, that, you know, she's doing it as a contingency because even after you have kids, yeah. you just don't know what situation, like financial situation the family's mm. going to be in. You mm. don't know if... Mm. I mean, if you've got... Uh, hypothetically, you know, you, your marriage doesn't work out and you're on your own, and then you've got yeah. nothing to sort of support yourself with. Um, yeah. If you're, you've got no skills, no experience that you've developed... Mm. Um, it makes it very difficult, I suppose, to yeah. raise your kids and 
yeah. you know, from their but lifestyle the, or whatever. If we're going to talk about that, um, so from an ideal perspective, I would say we need to actually pressure and shame um, men and the rest mm. of the community, wherever a woman like that lives, where we need to help those people, right? They, again, they shouldn't be in a position where they're forced to work, okay? Ideally. Now, that's often not the case, maybe. Uh, we need to work towards that. But, but if that's not the case, then I would say that I understand the, the idea of the contingency plan because it is possible that, you know, you get divorced, your husband dies, whatever. And, you know, you're in that situation, which is difficult. But a contingency plan, which costs 36K and several years of your life, along with other compromises, for me, that's yeah. a big uh, price to pay for a contingency plan. Wallahu a'ala. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. so um, she next said, uh, in terms of volunteering, which I agree, why, which I agree, why is our value based on capitalism? It's very limited in this specific skill set, and you always use your salary to for charity projects and helping family back home, etc. For example, after uni, I worked in a hospital, and although it was not the aim, I was able to get my sibling through uni riba free. I understand if someone was working in a more capitalist environment, e.g., marketing or accounting. Okay, so it's not that clear, but I think I got the point. That's saying you could even you could be working to get money, and that could also be for a good reason. So yeah, like yeah. if that this is the thing, like we have to be self-aware and like be aware of why am I doing it? Am I doing it out of pressure? Am I doing it because I want a new whatever, a nicer car or whatever, or am I doing it to pay for my siblings, you know, uni fees or you know, so just be mm. honest with us. I think that's what we're saying. Um, also, you mentioned nursing and working in female department. When you train, you have no choice which department you work at because you rotate to build skills till you get more senior and specialize. Same with doctors, midwives, etc. Okay. I think a lot, I think a lot to women, do of women do these healthcare jobs for the satisfaction of doing something good and making use of your skills. And it happens to pay in the West. All of this is in the context of not having children, but being either single or married without kids. In terms of Dean, we all strive to go through, go to classes and learn around studies, e.g. online. So it's not as if you, you have to completely neglect Dean if you have a full-time job. Just depends on your priorities. Well, yeah, it does depend on priorities, yeah. Mm. Um, Duh, duh, duh. As, as much as our fathers can provide us first gen immigrants with the qualifications we, uh, we can have, we can earn much more and do something more meaningful. If there's a need of volunteering in the pharmacy sector, it will most likely be abroad in developing countries, e.g. teaching people how to take their medications, which medications to avoid in different conditions, etc. We'll need a mahram for that, of course. So yeah, side point, even teachers in Islamic schools where you can have segregation, where jibab, et cetera, the pay is ridiculously low, 13K. Not that it's about the money, but teaching is demanding career. You spend a lot of time on the students and to only get back your travel money is difficult to stomach. I mean, I don't know about that last bit. Like, I think if you're going to pay teachers, you should bet pay them the proper salary. Um, yeah. Definitely. Uh, but, but then again, it's like, I think it's because of the context that it's difficult to stomach, right? Because if, like, if teaching part time uh, on a voluntary basis, if that was something that was really respected, and you so you respected that teacher's time, even though you're not paying them money, you respect that they're giving the time, and you really appreciate them, and they're obviously wanting to do it for the sake of Allah, and they're uh, allowing that school to flourish because they're not willing to not take a salary. And that's also good, you know. What I mean, like that—that that can mm. be. I think. I think. I think I've said it before. Like we often want it all. Um, so, like maybe to put the the whole women topic aside. Like for myself, like I want. I don't know. Like I want. Uh, I don't know if people can relate to this, but I want to get the. I'm doing the research for my book to try and uh, help men to understand what their role is as a Muslim man in the world, right? Now, I, I could say, uh, no, just you have to post on social media two times, three times a day. You have to write blog posts. You have to make loads of good videos. Yeah, you have to get out there with your sweat equity, if you know what I mean, yeah? yeah. Um, but my attitude is, you know, is, does anyone want to contribute um, so that I can then advertise and reach more people quicker, right? Yeah. But they could say, no, like just put the sweat equity in, you know? So yeah, yeah. I get it, like I kind of get it. But I mean, I don't know. The counter to that would be, 
I'm not taking any of the money myself. I'm just putting it into, uh, basically I'm not trying to get paid out of this. Um, it's just going into making the uh, mission more efficiently obtained potentially. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. But uh, it's a good email, I think, and some good thing, good points here. So. It's a slice of someone's cake, so to speak. Like they've got their circumstances and yeah, and and, and their you know the the obstacles that are within sort of their their sphere that causes mm. them or pushes them towards this. And like I said, mm. you know, fundamentally, there's the normative sort of what we say is the um, what did we call it? We used to call it a specific word. Uh, oh no. Utopia, utopian sort of, oh, okay. that's the word. Yeah, there's that utopian sort of thing that we always speak about. We refer to mm. that as like a utopian Muslim society. And then we sort of have to sieve it through mm. what obstacles we have mm -hmm. in this day and age. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, we, I like to, you know, we talk about the utopian society a lot because we strive to somehow possibly bring, you know, set the, set the, stage for that with generations mm -hmm. to come yeah. you know get closer um, to that little by little yeah yeah i mean i haven't got a daughter and inshallah one day i do and i'd like to think that i would be able to set her up so she wouldn't have to put herself through any of that you know my mm -hmm. sons i've got two sons i'm to learn i'm trying if anything i just want to teach them the responsibility <laughs> of doing something to attain what they want as opposed to just giving stuff to them, you know, uh, yeah. just to teach them about that work ethic sort of thing. Yeah. Man. But that's why the girls would just get spoiled, bro. If I have daughters, bro, it's just going to get spoiled. You don't need to work, darling. <laughs> <laughs> you can have what you want. <laughs> you know, I think I've, it's become very clear in my mind now that the utopian way when it comes to like gender roles, let's say, um, was not the norm for most of history. Uh, from what oh. I, I know now, like women used to work, like yeah. they used to have to do a lot, even, you know, physically demanding work. Um, but what was always consistent, I think, is that women did certain roles and men had certain roles and they weren't mixing together and they had their specific roles. So if I was to apply that to 2020, I would say if women have to work, then they have to work, but just make it so women work in their area, men work in their area. There's no clash, there's no competition, there's no conflict. That, that seems to be the pattern here that works. It's, then, the, it's that competition element, isn't it? I mean, mm. competition between the genders or sexes or whatever you want to call it in this day and age. Um, because even, you know, 100 years ago, 50 years, 50 years ago, bro, there was like jobs where it was like, oh, that's what women do. You know, that's what yes. women like. Yeah. Um, even here, bro, like, uh, I think like, for example, in like the emergency services, people that would answer the phones would all be women. Like the, the, the phone, that was like known to be that sort of job. Or, mm. you know, you've got on the, uh, the healthcare sector, you've got nurses, like nurses were known to be women. Like that was the, mm. that was sort of the sphere. Mm. And then you, mm. it's the merging that creates a bit of a, like yeah. culture decides. Even bro. you don't culture even know decide, how to but... interact with women at work, bro. Like, like, I was writing about this, like a man at work, his colleagues, you know, in, in his team, let's say he has, he has plenty of several women in his team with the men. There is a code of conduct, if you like, that is agreed upon men growing up, how you talk to each other, how you joke with each other, all of that. When it comes to women, there isn't such, it's like you actually, I don't know about you, but I grew up with a certain way that I should treat girls or women and it was different to men right definitely mm. different now at work now because of political you know political correctness and all that you're supposed to treat the women the same as the men but then ultimately the women won't like that and actually women will start saying oh it's abusive or it's i don't know it's bullying or it's yeah. harassment but this is actually just how men treat men so yeah. it's like either we treat women differently and that and therefore the equality is kind of a bit gone there uh, or we treat them like men and then they're just going to have to deal with being treated yeah. like a man you know i suppose the way i've the way i've gotten around it all mm. is to absolutely have a zero tolerance social policy at work where <laughs> i will not socialize like beyond that i just won't you know what i mean like yeah no friendly friendly no friendly friendly with anybody um mm. i'm you know i'm, I'm respectful 
I'm yeah. polite. Formal, and I'll, basically, you know, yeah. Yeah, I'll help people if they need help and whatever. Mm. But I'll keep that as my consistent sort of thing between both men, women, whoever it is, because at least that way, you're not dragged into anything. Yeah. Not, because there's always politics. There's always, you know, mm -hmm. some sort of social dynamic and group or whatever. I don't, I don't care about any of that. You know, you just define yourself by your morals in terms of this is what I do, this is what I don't like. Like, for example, people try and drag you in. Okay, people try and drag you into even though they're all non-Muslims and really it shouldn't really matter to me that much. However, people try and drag you into backbiting and drag you into talking about this person. Yeah. And I've had it, Akhi. I've had it where I've, uh, what's the word? Like I've sort of, I've sort of sent them a, a bit of a sub, uh, subconscious message to them. I've said like, Oh, I hope you don't talk about me. Like you talk to yeah. about so and so behind yeah. behind their back. You know I mean? I've said yeah. it as straight as that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. That's it. And I'll say it like half joking, half not. Yeah. Um, just so they kind of get the idea that I'm not interested in talking like this. Yeah. I'm not yeah. Interested yeah. Talking about this yeah. person. Yeah. Um, they don't really... have this concept of backbiting and this and that. Like it's yeah. normal. It's normal. I mean, they would know. Everyone knows it's bad because nobody wants it to be done to them. But then yeah. it's become so normal, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and it's more about hiding it and not making making sure the other doesn't know, rather than not doing it in the first place. And and if you think about it, that's like a deep point about our aqidah in terms of Allah. Allah is the one seeing. Allah is hearing. Yeah, what yeah. You do. It's rampant, bro. Like it's absolutely like it wasn't until I started practicing and started really taking the seriously and realizing the the gravity of doing something like that and speaking about people behind their backs that I've realized how rampant it is in. In, you know non-muslim society like it's absolutely normal it's like yeah. you they will you know they'll be absolutely obliterating someone behind their back and that person will walk mm. through the door and they'll be like oh hello blah, blah, blah. treat them with absolute like, so oh man. and i hate it i hate it because mm. it's normal that's not that's not honorable bro that's not dignified no, no, no. at all no no Even and not only is that but like the the humor element like things that make people laugh things that have to be mm. funny it's all just dark and yeah. uh, it's either dark or gross or stuff like yeah. it's just, I don't mm. want to be associated with any of that whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why in Islam, even to the point, even when it comes to business, the point of the laws and the rules and regulations in Islam related to business, the objective is to have good relations between Muslims, you know, ultimately, you yeah. know, yeah. that's why, yeah. for example, uh, you can't have, uh, what's the word? You can't have uh, Un, you know lack of clarity in a contract why because it's not like i guess part of it is from don't cheat somebody don't you know let things be clear don't let but ultimately it's like don't let arguments happen when the, it's not yeah. clear you know don't yeah. make somebody feel like they've been cheated etc like that's more important than making money you know so yeah, yeah. and especially uh, in a community um those those wounds run deep in a community because yeah. you start it starts with like let's say hypothetically it started with me and you right and then that rift grows bigger when the people that associate between me and you then have to start picking sides because yeah. you force them to pick sides yeah, man. and then suddenly you've got this massive rift so mm. Mm. it's true and even like it's crazy how i don't know if you've ever felt this or witnessed it but when somebody's trying to backbite and the, like i've i've been in the place where i was backbiting, borderline backbiting, like even if it's not necessarily something bad, but I'm saying something, right, uh, about somebody. And the, the person I'm with, they don't want anything to do with it, right? And they will just, yeah. like, I'll just be talking and then I'll finish what I'm saying and then they'll just be like, yeah. And for yeah. some reason, that's annoying. Like, come on, bro, like, yeah, backbite yeah, yeah. with me, bro. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's not, oh, no. You know what I mean, right? It's like, it feels, yeah, I don't know, yeah. maybe, maybe for me, when I've slipped in the circumstance, it's like I realize that I'm just being Shaytan right now. Like, it's really I'm easy to fall into, yeah. 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 It's really easy to fall into when you've got, you know, you've, you're very, very emotionally charged or someone's rightfully done, that, you know, someone's done you wrong and yeah. whatever, you know, someone's slacking, someone's being lazy, whatever it is. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, it doesn't change the situation, does it? Yeah. Talking about people. Yeah. Doesn't Often you just happen. You just forget um, that it even is backbiting because maybe genuinely with me, I'm a very matter of fact person. So for me, it's yeah. like, like I just told the guy to his face the thing I'm telling you now. So it doesn't feel like backbiter, but it, you know, it is. Yeah. So yeah. And oh yeah, bro. So going back to the thing about like women used to work, right? However, in the uh, ideal 
situation. I think it's kind of like that uh, American dream scenario where, you know, America in the 50s, 60s, uh, very economically prosperous back then. And there was the whole culture of, you know, the man goes out, the woman's at home. And that w that's like a modern phenomenon because of economic prosperity. So we, mm. we do want that. We do aim for that. But it's like also recognizing that's not been the reality for a lot of human history, you know? Mm. Um, so, yeah, let's move on, bro. Uh, Ask FM or Curious Cat, is it? Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, let's have a look. Um... I'm looking very overproduced compared to your camera. <laughs> My dark hair, I haven't really got any light source and the baby's sleeping while well, he's trying to sleep over there. Um, let's, let's do this one. Uh, Salaam alaikum. Let me ask your perspective as a man. Why are some Muslim males... Uh, youth falling into misogynistic ideologies such as red pill and incel why is there such a deep anxiety of liberalism slash feminism among them and do you think men like daniel Hapikadju and his followers bear partial blame for this um, good question question i what do you think bro so the the, the first part is why do they fall into that so why do you think that Muslim youth are falling into misogynistic ideologies? Yeah. Um, such as red pill and incel. Yeah. Why is there such a deep anxiety of liberalism slash feminism amongst them? And right. do you think that Daniel and his followers are part mm. of the partial blame mm. for this? I think there's like two <coughs> reasons for it. Uh, one reason is, well, firstly, uh, I just want to say that uh, it's a bit broad to say that those things are misogynistic, okay? Because they're quite broad. It's like saying feminism uh, is X, Y, Z. Like there's so many strands of feminism. Yes, there, are, there's, there is like a collective concept behind it, but feminists argue between themselves, just how these kind of red pill <clears throat> people yeah. will uh, argue between themselves. But I think there are two reasons that uh, men might go towards those kind of things. Number one is... Uh, because they genuinely are concerned for the family unit and for society and for moral, uh, you know, uprightness, right? And that's probably, to be honest and fair, it might be the minority, you know, less than half. The others uh, go towards there because they feel disenfranchised. They feel like it's not allowed to be, uh, they're not allowed to be masculine. They're not allowed mm. those natural things that they they have right they also been stripped of their purpose or their role in the world so they they, they feel disenfranchised ultimately and so they you know what's that thing uh, men going their own way m-o-t m-o-g-w <laughs> whatever it is that's right know. men are going their own way right what's that all about it's like okay you know feminism has ruined society let's get out of here let's go the other way right so um the, uh, for me, I completely empathize with that feeling. Um, I, I feel like the solution that these, ultimately these non-Muslims coming from that point of view, uh, they're not going to bring the right solution. But I can empathize mm. with it. Ultimately, you know, you take away somebody's role and somebody's pride and somebody's, mm. it, it, ultimately sometimes it gets to the point where it's like uh, among Muslims, where you're basically telling a man that it's haram to be a man. It's haram to be masculine. Sometimes mm. it gets to that level. So I think that's why it happens. Mm. I mean, the, the, well, for, like you said, first and foremost, they have to define what feminism is being, you know, the anxiety is coming from. Because really, a lot of isms, I'll bite feminism, a lot of isms give Muslims anxiety. It doesn't matter what it is like. Do you know what I mean? Capitalisms and communisms and feminisms mm -hmm. and this ism and that. Everything, there's loads of isms that give Muslims anxiety and it only impacts Muslims in certain areas. Like capitalism impacts Muslims in certain fields. And, you know, the reason why feminism as a whole may give it, anxiety to muslim men is because of the targeted feminism that seeks not to just make men and women equal but also um 
in, in some cases try and has this sort of superiority complex thing where it tries to make women even better than men in certain mm. things and the thing is muslim men aren't saying that women are better at men at certain things we're not here to say that you know women are are fundamentally inferior in in in, in everything in everything, mm. in everything no what we're saying is that we have we each have our defined roles. The thing is with the competition element of women competing with men in the same arena as men, mm. and then men almost being guilt tripped yes. to, to, to take part in that competition. Yes. You understand what I mean? It's like you're in the arena, but you're also you, you're in the arena under the guise of fairness and equality, but also the cultural pressure upon men is to not compete. Yes not enter you know? the combat so it's like it's like on one angle it's the fair quality competition but on the other hand you're still benefiting from the from the, the 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 benefits of patriarchy which is a sense of oh i'm gonna allow the woman to win or allow the woman yeah. you know this kind of element it's of like this bro maybe this is a, tell me is a good have your cake and eat it sort of thing so but yeah. imagine maybe this this could be an analogy for everything that goes on, you know, in the workplace, in et cetera, right? So a man and a woman, they're in the cage, right? Imagine yeah. a UFC, right? They're in the cage. And then before the fight starts, they say, well, this isn't fair. Like, this is a man, this is a woman. And the man has, been, has, has got these advantages. So we need to break the man's leg. So break mm -hmm. one of his legs. So he's kind of handicapped. So now it becomes more equal, right? Then yeah. when the man goes and you know he's he's gonna just give the elbow to the woman yeah <laughs> then yeah. they say then they say no no like you're not supposed to engage that way you, you can only slap her right you're not allowed yeah. to use your elbows your knees you're only allowed to slap her right. and then you know and so they try to make it equal but then when he went in with the combat like he's like okay so now that I, my leg's been broken I've, I've got that kind of disadvantage we're supposed to be equal now okay now let me go at it in a in the equal way, right? Yeah, go at it how I, I can, would go yeah. at it. But then they're like, yeah. no, you can't go at it that way. Like, come on. And then he's like, well, I thought we were fighting here. Like, you know, I, I was just fighting. They're like, no, you're not allowed to fight that way. And, and then yeah, he's yeah, just yeah, like, yeah. well, you've broken my leg and now you're not allowing me to fight the way I know to fight. So I quit. Like, what, what am I supposed to do here? Yeah, yeah. That could be an analogy. That could be, you know, there could be ways it could be taken the wrong way, but it could be an, al an analogy for what is happening. And I, I imagine this happens in the corporate world a lot, man. Like, you know, you're in a team, there are women on the team and, you know, you might be, you know, am amongst men, you know, men can be quite direct with each other. When you're direct with a woman, maybe it's taken the wrong way because women interact very differently to men and all of that. And then you start having to, um, uh, what's the word, censor yourself um, a lot. And it just, it, it ultimately performance at work would suffer and just messed up, man. Mm. Well, the, was there any other parts of that question? I know there but, was... but I do think, bro, that this, uh, I've read like at least one of these books written by one of these kind of red pill people, right? And some of the stuff they say is really stupid, ridiculous. And yeah. that's what I'm trying to do here, bro. Like I'm trying to write yeah. a book where it's like, this is our way, right? Like yeah. uh, the, in the, uh, I wrote the, I finished the introduction like last week or something. And in it, I was like two, two ideologies or concepts or ideas that are destroying the family unit. One is feminism. The other is this alpha male uh, idea, right? Mm. Uh, both of them. Right. And we don't want to go down either route. Yeah. There are, there are things that are because a lot of this stuff comes from non-Muslims within their own cultural understanding of things. Yeah. Um, there are things that sometimes may resonate with Muslims, may hit the nail on the head, just like anyone, you know, you fire enough shots and some of them are going to land on the truth. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, like for example, one person that people, and I sometimes listen to some of his work is Jordan Peterson, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the stuff he says makes sense. A lot of this other stuff doesn't, like a lot of stuff doesn't align with us. However, the Muslims will champion, Muslim men will champion maybe him or his views or whatever, because there may be a gap there that Muslims don't feel like is being addressed by. Yeah. And I'll talk about like a direct psychological sort of, uh, you know, a speaker, Muslim speaker, speaking yeah. about psychology, whatever. Yeah. Um, not that that always needs to be filled. And like, I, I think, yeah, sometimes Muslim men, me, myself included, we fall into this trap of, 
sort of looking elsewhere when it's right in front of us kind of thing like we look for validation from a psychologist from a biologist from you know some sort of academic sort of sphere to validate the, the it, to validate islam when actually islam doesn't need validation from anywhere it validates itself mm -hmm. so if you just study islam as it is and what is presented to us and the classical way of studying it then that's the validation there and then yeah. um i think also a lot of men um muslim men who are not married mm. and who are possibly struggling to get married struggling to be in a position to get married they can also have this element of maybe going overboard with it frustration yeah frustration because because yeah. it might there's have, a frust yeah, probably has definitely gotten harder um yeah there's, things, there's a right? frustration that they cannot be, find a partner because the expectation mm. yeah because they, their, their their perception is that this feminist narrative has raised the bar yeah. beyond what they're capable of yeah. it's also raised the bar in terms of what can be what's um, compatible with them mm -hmm. so like they they envision their family being one particular thing but all these women that, yes. that are out exactly. there envision something else so that's mm -hmm. that's what, another thing further mm -hmm. and also you've got you know on the on the i wouldn't say extreme scale but on the far far furthest scale you've got the whole you know the biggest impact of what quote unquote feminism on the muslim scene is like um the negative uh, connotations towards multiple having multiple wives or the autonomy of a man or uh decision making or do you understand all these i'm not saying these are the be or end all but these bring a whole picture onto why it may be that men feel like mm. the the feminist not ideology but you know the aura that it gives is yeah. this is detracting from the autonomy of a man in that yeah. sense or their ability to be quote unquote men to mm -hmm. the fullest. Yeah. You know? I've seen, I've seen it myself, bro. Like, uh, men who, you know, deep down they, they, they're like, I want, for example, Oh, I wouldn't want my wife to work for example, basic thing. Right. And I've seen even other men kind of trying to shame them saying like, come mm. on, bro, like blah, 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 blah. And it's like that, at the very least, you should say, well, okay, it's your personal preference, you know. But what is happening is the shame is going in that direction where it's like, oh, why would you want that? Why would you say that? Why would you ask that? And it's coming from, obviously, less, but it's coming from men sometimes. And then, it, obviously, it's coming from the women where it's like the, the man feels like, okay, he goes to meet a pr prospective wife and he, you know, he, he's kind of anxious about saying, well, I wouldn't really, you know, my idea of a family is one where, you know, my wife would be at home and I'll go and work. He might feel anxious about saying that. Oh, how, how will she react? Oh, she's really good looking. So I don't want like to put her off. So I'll just say, yeah, yeah. Like, what yeah, she wants, you can yeah, work she if you want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what you this want to hear is, sort of thing. Uh, yeah, it's true, bro. Um, and then the, the then they, you've also got men that sort of they pander to that on purpose like you see on social media a lot they may be i think they're called white nights bro white nights. <laughs> is that what it is <laughs> no well, white like, nights like uh, the men who kind of stand up for the women and uh, you know yeah, in order to get um attention female attention this is it and i think women are very naive and not realizing that that's what the whole thing is like yeah i think men yeah. men in the same way women i'm sure women can read other women i think men know what a man is about straight away mm. like just know like you see those sort of arguments, you see some, uh, uh, some brother like getting involved, trying to defend women or trying to promote this. Mm. And it's like, whoa, like I know exactly what you're trying, boy. Mm. <laughs> but I don't know, man, that's been a long time since I've been involved in any of those discussions. You know, <laughs> um, you know uh, I think if, if the person asking this is interested, I did a podcast with The Thinking Muslim. We talked about this stuff. It was a good one, I think. So if you go to The Thinking Muslim, he doesn't have number his episodes, but just look for oh, the right. one that's with Amin, with Amin, Sarah Masters. There you go, Thinking Muslim. And then uh, the last part of the question was, do you think Daniel Hakikaju has a part to play, a role to play in this? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'll be honest, I don't know. I, I, I was subscribed to him about until about a week ago. Mm. Um, I don't know, I just, I've tried to, get i try to sort of get rid of a lot of uh, i don't know if you want to call it drama it's a lot of drama and yeah. i'm just so tired of it and it's not nothing against him personally or anything like that. i don't know him that well i never really watched that many youtube videos these days mm. um like and it, I, don't, I could list the name of amazing people that are on youtube but they still get involved in drama and i've had to yeah. sort of mute that because yeah 
there's not enough time mm -hmm. where you can benefit right mm -hmm. and that's not just because of physical time but also time where you you feel like you're in a mood where you you're going to allow that content to yeah. be consumed you're you know? frustrated because of the drama you're thinking oh, what's my opinion on it yeah so like it's not always that i can actually be like oh do you know what i could really do with watching a lecture now mm. or watching something beneficial and you're in that mood and then you go onto youtube and then you see something that is a bit drama related you're like oh and the clickbait gets you and then suddenly yeah. you've wasted like 30 minutes to an hour where you could have where you were in a good position to learn something yeah and it's just been stripped away because you've been sucked into like i i got into that recent last night actually i was God, I don't, I don't even want to name YouTubers or anything. Nothing wrong with them. But like, I just got drawn into this YouTube video about a res response to this, to this, to that. Mm. And I was like, I don't listen to any of these people. But why yeah. am I here yeah. listening to them talk back and forth, yeah. like refute each other, whatever? I don't care about any of them. Yes. It doesn't bother me, but I, I've been sucked into that. And I didn't want to be, and I didn't need mm. to be. Mm. Um, so yeah, so mm. like I said, um, uh, from what I know of the brother, or I don't know anything that much really. I know that he he responds a lot to um, these kind of liberal ideas, uh, liberal ideas, stuff like that. And I think there's a place for that and necessity for that. Mm. And I think, from what I know of him, he's somebody who I think he he often has people that he speaks to live. Like so, so he'll have someone he speaks to that he disagrees with, or they disagree with him, and he'll do that in an act sort of semi-academic way whatever you want to call it and that's fine mm. that's respectful mm. I, I respect mm. that mm. um is he so, pushing people to the red pill thing though uh, trying to be objective here i would say he's not and the reason is he critiques for example feminism that doesn't mean he's pushing people to red pill what he means is he's pu he's pulling people away from feminism and then you've got to look at where does he push them he's pushing mm. them to islamic solutions like he never links to uh, any of these like subreddits or whatever he's just linking to i don't know uh, whether it's shuh whether it's hadith whatever or whether it's just himself yeah. so he's not promoting that stuff at all he's simply yeah. critiquing feminism and critiquing feminism doesn't push people to to red pill whatever you want to call it per se no and no. i'm not even saying i agree or disagree with what he does i'm just saying objectively i, I don't think he's doing that really no, I think ultimately, you know, somebody who's trying to bring Muslim men, just like a lot of speakers, Akhi, whether you agree with them or not, they're trying to bring Muslims closer to their deen, you know, yeah. and, and there's there's obviously challenges and obstacles that have arisen within yeah. cultures and, 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 you know, these genders even that need to be ironed out. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, you can't, the questioner is saying it as if there's no issue with feminism, you know. Why do men have anxiety with feminism? Like, why is that your question? Mm. Like, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, why are Muslim? The, part of the question is why are Muslim men? Uh, why do Muslim men have an anxiety towards feminism? Right, mm. that's part of the question, right? So, why is that even a question? Like, of course, of course, we should. Muslim mm. women should have an anxiety towards feminism. Mm. Yes, do you understand? I suppose the question should be, what or is there a conflict between the Islamic yeah. worldview and? The feminist worldview of course there's there's the thing is anything other than islam any way worldview other than islam mm, should give you some level of anxiety yeah should mm. give you a level of anxiety because yeah. it's not islam yeah. you know feminism is is trying to as a whole and i'm being very general here mm. it's got there's theories and there's 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 sort of modus operandi of it all that are trying to do something change the way society is or yeah. change the way the dynamics are mm. Mm -hmm. however it's that's within a that's within a sphere that's completely outside of islam like that was that's something that doesn't take it doesn't operate within islam it's not a movement that has come about within islam um to such as i like i don't know let's say hypothetically the salafi movement yeah the salafi movement was came from within islam to to try and bring uh people back to the Quran and Sunnah and the authentic hadith, etc. And then live by the live by the understanding of the Salaf, right? That's that's the mm. the blurb on the back of the book, hypothetically. Yeah. But feminism isn't something that's come out of Islam like that. Yeah. It's not drawing on Islam like that. This is something mm. completely open you know, yeah. different. It's like anyone coming to you with some movement. You, if it's not from Islam, then of course you're gonna have some anxiety about yeah. swallowing the pills that they give you. So Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. yeah well, okay, next one.
um, this is one I've been interested to answer for a while. So sister says, Assalamu alaikum brothers. Inshallah, you and your families are both in the best of health and Iman. I pray Allah grants Shifa to Muhammad's father, Shifa to Muhammad's father, and grant ease during this episode of difficulty for your family. Ameen, ya Allah, ameen. Uh, I'm a sister currently in my mid-twenties, and although married, I still go through a lot of difficulty to maintain and build a relationship with my father, and to an extent, my younger brother. I feel like you guys might understand, as you're both North African, in particular, Amin, as my dad is Algerian. I have learnt with time that my dad's behaviour is at some points extremely manipulative and emotionally abusive, and although I do, I do know he loves me as, my fa as any father would, he has deeply affected me, and I still go through traumatic episodes with him despite not living together anymore due to being married. Mm -hmm. It has improved since I left. However, unfortunately, my parents recently separated, and my father seems to be emotionally unstable and is taking it out on me since my mom is no longer in the picture. I understand that Algerian dads do not process emotion very well. However, it really upsets me that he doesn't try to go about things the right Islamic way. As much as I want to help him, I also find it hard to safeguard myself and my mental health, and I don't want to abandon him. However, I'm very disheartened that this is happening again, and I do not have the energy to rebuild our relationship again after he constantly gaslights me and intimidates me. Without going, in, uh, going into detail, a mild example is that when I try to reason with my father, he tends to twist or misinterpret my words on purpose, and it creates an air of anxiety and tension every time I have a conversation with him. He's yeah. adamant that he is never wrong, even though I try to say this indirectly as not to offend him. And my brother tends to side with him a lot, so I have no other siblings to support me when I'm dealing with these episodes. My question is, how can I further this relationship according to the Sunnah without jeopardizing my mental health? It has reached a point where I do not even like to visit without my husband staying with me as I'm worried if I am home with him alone, he will start another abusive episode. May Allah reward you both for your answer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and she says, uh, and then she sent an e another email just saying, I forgot to mention an important point. My father always has shown preference of my brother over me and ignored me slash my ideas in order that my brother can undermine me, which I know is another aspect of Algerian culture considering he is the only son. This has severely impacted my self-confidence and self-esteem as I never feel good enough to my dad. And despite talking about it to him on numerous occasions, he fails to notice that pattern of behavior. Yeah. It's so it's this expectation element of so she said at the end there, I've tried to talk to him about how this is affecting my mental health, etc. However, a lot of our a lot of these generations, a lot of you know, people I've seen in that age bracket of our fathers, etc. Mm. It's not something they believe even exists, like this mental health impact, like the impact that it can have. Uh, the, the focus that we have, our generation at least, has on mental health and the, you know, the health and well-being of our minds and how we operate isn't necessarily something that was even spoken about back then, right? Mm. So it's something that we would just be scoffed at. I think there's nothing wrong with where, where she's established herself now. She said, that I don't feel comfortable going unless my husband's with me. Well, there's, perfect, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that's it. You've, I feel like that is your, you've struck that balance now because you've identified that if you're with your husband, then that isn't going to happen. And you still fulfill your father's rights by going to see him. Do you understand what I mean? Like you would still operate like the, the, the thing is you're not going to, I don't, you know, it's very unlikely that he's going to change his ways just by you speaking to him. It's very unlikely that he's going to change his, anything about his behavior when he's that, that age, he's that set in stone, he's that culturally sort of impacted and he's got stuff going on in his life. Right. And with, with, with parents, um, it's, it's, it's not something that they think too deeply about too often about the impact that they're going to have on their child yeah. because it's like it's their right to behave how they want to behave to their child like you are a right of theirs right and i think what we've grown up in a society that has preached to us that our parents owe us something you know and i think i spent a lot of my years growing up with some level of resentment towards my dad because i felt like my dad owed me something emotionally i felt like oh you look at all these other parents or look what's on TV or look, I was comparing my, me and my dad's relationship to what was out there, what was out there in the media, what was out there in, you know, anything. That, that like, was oh, before social media even. Yeah. 
yeah, like I felt like, oh, my dad should be emotionally connected to me. He should ask me how I'm doing. He should, and then that would make me resent him because he was never those things. Take you so to I baseball ended, practice. Exactly, stuff like that. And I realized, <laughs> it's not till now that I realized my dad doesn't owe me anything. Like if anything, I owe my dad, you know, I owe, I'm the one who, who has to answer for how I treated my parents. Of course, he has to answer how he treated me, but not to the level, I, at least in my perspective, not to the level that I, you know, have to treat him. So what you need to do is, it's hard, but you have to train yourself to delete delete this element of impact that your father has upon you or your parents have upon you. So like, you know, just because my father's ill now doesn't mean that he doesn't say things that upset me or disagrees with me or whatever, or there's like something he wants me to do in my life that I don't want to do. But actually, what we do is we position ourselves in a way that we, we respectfully, even if we agree, we say, inshallah, we'll think about it or whatever. That's it. Like, I don't want to be in a position where I say, I say no to my dad and upset him. I don't want to be in a position where I... Um, you know, if my dad says something to me or advises me to do something that I really don't think is a good idea, I'll, I'll respectfully, I'll say, I'll think about it. I'll respectfully say, oh, you know what? Yeah, you might have a point. Let me think about it. Like, that's the best I'll, I'll do. I'm not going to say no. I'm not going to start an argument. I'm not going to, because mm-hmm. actually, actually, like, it doesn't matter. Like, this sister, is it his sister? The sister, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. This sister right now, like, the moment her dad dies, all of this is, this question, she was going to wish she never even wrote this question. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Mm-hmm. Like, the, the impact the, the, the emotional sort of distress that you're going to be going through when your father is on his deathbed or you, you no longer have your father, you're going to wish that you were dealing with this as opposed to dealing with him dead. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I know that's powerful, but that is, that's honestly some of the truth. Like we, we get to a point where, actually where ask your parents or ask your, you know, if your parents, if your grandparents are still alive, if they're not, then I'll lie at home home. But ask your parents, like, would they, my mum, my mum says to me, I wish my dad was still around to shout at me like he used to. Mm. Do you understand? Like, and I know that my mum didn't have the greatest relationship with my granddad. However, she just wishes that she could just hear his voice again. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? And this is what I mean by like, we've grown up in a society. And I think that's my biggest takeaway from all of this. We've grown up in a society that makes us feel like our parents owe us um, mm. Or they do, and yes, parents can be abusive. There are parents that do leave a very, very bad impact on their ch- children, and they can be abusive, and they have. But if you're, if you feel like you're safe enough to still visit, which she stated she is, she feels safe enough that she wants to develop a relationship. You know, it's not like the abuse is to a, a point where actually this is very detrimental. I'm in danger here. You know, it seems to be, and Allah knows best. It seems to be at this stage that it's verbal a lot of the time it's about invalidating her opinions it's about not giving her the respect or whatever but she still wants something from him do you want to fulfill your duty to your father because of you know for the sake of allah because that's what it should be or is it because you want something from him you want him to fill mm, to, to fill a void you, yeah to validate you or fill a void that you never got because if that's what you're expecting that you have to kind of draw the line that's not something you may ever get yeah you know you yeah. can't you know i thought I remember even when my father got ill, I, I like one thing that always used to ho- ho- hold me up was I used to think, oh, my father's never told me that he's proud of me. Like that was something that was always in my head, like crazy mm. sort of thing. And um, I just used to focus on that. And then I recently I was like, it doesn't really matter, you know, but he's, I can't remember. He said something close to it, but not necessarily it. And I was like, oh, that's, that's going to have to do. Like, take what you can get kind of thing, you know? Mm. And if, you, if she's, the sister said, like, I know that my father loves me. And he, I think she said something along those lines. She said something about, like, since she got married, it's been a yeah. little bit better. Like, she knows that he cares for her. But that's what you have to focus on. And if yeah. he's acting out because of what you're going through, then, then, then you've already sort of tried to validate what he's going through. You've tried mm. to give him an excuse in that sense. Yeah. Um, yeah at that age it's very difficult for for them to change you have to take what you can get and you're not going to have the uh, you can hear my kid just moaning (laughs) you're not gonna have the sort of golden relationship that you sometimes see like sometimes you see on social media like there's women that post their fathers and they're all cute and they do this for Mm -hmm. their daughters and that for their daughter and i kind of understand you can be jealous you know and even men like you'll see um men with relationships with their fathers that are really close and loving and very out there and whatever. And it's one of those things again, where you're comparing your relationship to that with other people, mm. try and focus on what your father's done for you. 
try and focus on the good that he's done for you. The fact mm. that you're still here, the fact that you're married and Allah knows best, but I'm sure he, he helped in some way, even if he didn't agree, but I'm sure in some way you're married because he, as your welly sort of facilitated that. There's so many things mm. that our parents do for us that we just, we just take for granted because we are, once again, I'll finally say we are in a society that makes us feel like our parents owe us something very deep emotional like they need to be there for everything they need to nurture us uh, emotionally and and, and 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 our mental health and all this stuff and you have to take charge and you have to be able to take matters mm. into your own hands with this you know mm. in the i really love this book uh, uh the way of the superior man okay yep. he's got a chapter called live as though your father is dead mm. yeah and it's all about not going about your life trying to get validation from your dad or from anyone and waiting for approval and it's just be be your father you know what i mean like yeah, yeah, as yeah. though you are that figure but anyway i wanted to say to the sister that the way you know she's articulated it is is very good and very clear and for me bro it shows like real um sincerity and yeah, uh, genuinely wanting uh, to have the best relationship um with her dad for the sake of allah i think she's just um, concerned and worried that it's actually going to damage her in maybe an irreparable way. Um, mm. I mean, uh, I, I have a bit of a pet peeve with these words like trauma and abuse because uh, I think you need to be a mo bit more specific. I mean, even for me to answer this question, uh, for me to under get a clearer picture, I don't know what abusive means here, but I I'm just kind of tr trying to make assumptions here. But what I would say is, um, like what you said, Muhammad, is true, right? That uh, maybe the sister is, you know, and I agree with her, like it, that should be the, the real, the, the norm. It should be that, you know, father is actually the, the figure that gives his daughter um, confidence. You know, that should yeah. be the, the thing. Um, however, you know, the dunya is a test and maybe this is one of the sister's tests. Um, and many of us, you know, might be tested with that. And I think uh, that is one of the, the ways that Allah tests us a lot is with that through our parents. Like, um, uh, you know, and imagine the person who, you know, their parents are drug addicts or something like that. And, you know, how much you could blame them for everything that goes wrong in your life. But then that would be the exact chance where, for the sake of Allah, you actually still find a place to be grateful to them. Right? And that just mm. might be your your challenge, your struggle. So what I would say is, I would say, get as close um, as possible without it having that deeper um the damage to you right because for example mm. what you don't want is to get more damaged and then so damaged that you actually don't want those basic visits anymore like i know you already kind of maybe um you avoid those visits or you uh what's the word you you uh basically you're not you don't look forward to those visits right i know mm. you probably already feel like that but you don't want it to get to a point where it's like now you're, you're not going like at least once a month or one, whatever, once a week or whatever it is you do. You want it to be a regular, regular visits, um, regular communication and relationship. You don't want it to get worse. Right. And being getting things getting worse, I would define as you feeling less inclined to visit you feeling less inclined to help and serve your father. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I would say, visit as much as you can without more damage being incurred on your side, right? And the reason that you don't want to be damaged is so that you, you don't decrease that relationship you have with your father, right? Of course, I know you're, talk, you're thinking of yourself. You need to look out for your, yourself as well. I get that as well. But that's how you strike the balance, I feel, where it's like visit enough, but don't visit too much that it's actually going to damage you. You won't want to visit anymore, right? Now, the other thing I would say is, to actually start seeing your father as the victim here, right? Because it is the duty of the child to do as much as they can for their parents without limits, right? Mm. Really without hardly any limits, right? Um, and it's equally though, it's, it's the, maybe not equally, but it's also the duty of the parent to do the best in terms of raising their children. And if they damage their children in any way or whatever, then yes, they're gonna be accountable for that. Um, but think of it from your father's point of view, because of whatever, the way he is, the way he's struggling, he can't, he, he just is that way right now. Maybe he's, he's a bit of an older age, it's hard for him to change. He is a victim in the sense where 
maybe he's going to really struggle or maybe he's going to find it impossible for him to actually be as good as he could be with his children and with his daughter. Mm. And so you need to see him in a, as a victim in a way because obviously he is going to have to answer to Allah for that. So you need to, you need to think, think of all the reasons why he may be the way he is. Maybe it's the way his yeah. parents were. Maybe it's something that happened in his life and you don't even know about it, right? It's so, just, yeah, it's so the you, same discussion, bro, of, of the mental health thing. So oh. that generation processes mental health issues differently, right? Yeah. So that that is... So he's got some, some, you know, maybe trauma, maybe some sort of issues that he's going through, and that's the way he's projecting it. Yeah. You know, and that's the moment you do that is when you, like you said, you can visualize them as a victim because now suddenly you realize that the same thing they're all going through. Yeah. Because this is the thing we we have this thing, bro, where we think of our parents as invincible because we've grown up with them being invincible. Mm. You know, mm. like I grew up thinking my dad was untouchable mentally. Cause I just never saw him cry. I never saw him, you know, yeah, I saw him get angry and stuff, but that wasn't, that didn't detract from his masculinity. It didn't detract from his sort of, I can do, he can do anything like Jimmy. Yeah. He can, but actually I'm a parent now and I know how vulnerable I can be. And you're a yeah. parent now. I'm sure you know how vulnerable you can be. And then it's like, Oh, actually parenthood doesn't make anybody invincible. You know, mm. my son probably sees me as invincible, you know, and he probably will do for a while. But it, w it won't be until he's an adult that he realizes, actually, yeah. I'm just like, you know, you're just like yeah. him. And I'm just like, do you understand what I mean? So, yeah. yeah, your father's vulnerable as well. Your father has mental health issues as well. Your father is dealing mm. with stuff as well. Yeah. So your father is just as much as a victim as you are to the sort of whatever is out there affecting him. So, yeah. 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 So as much as you, you, you can also be a victim while he's a victim, by the way. Right. Mm. So by me saying that you can see him as a victim in a sense, it doesn't mean I'm negating your victimhood, but I'm mm. saying that if you perceive him as the victim here, you're actually going to be much more. I think you'll actually be more uh, resistant to whatever, you know, um, harm he's doing to you. Right. Yeah. And then the third thing I would say is you, you got to you got to know how fathers are. You got to know how Algerian fathers are. Right. Uh, ultimately, Sometimes there's very simple things that we just don't do, sometimes because of ego or sometimes because of justice. You want a sense of justice, right? So yeah. you might feel that it is wrong or it's demeaning or it hurts your ego or it's not fair to go and get your dad a cup of tea, right, without yeah. him asking. But I'm saying that those kind of gestures, and it's a gesture, it's not like a task or a chore it's a gesture that you're actually making those kind of gestures gestures can completely warm him up to you completely yeah yeah right um you know it's it's almost a cliche that all oh, the the path to a man's heart's through his stomach and these kind of things um, and i think yeah. it's a very some some things you're going to have to discuss for hours with someone and bring in a mediator and but with your dad it might be the case make him a few cups of tea make him a cake go to yeah. visit make him a cake give him the cake like bring him the cake on a tray with some tea and he didn't even ask for it that yeah. could that could really open his heart, heart up to you you know yeah. and again uh, you might say well you wouldn't say that to my brother right but that's what i'm saying that you just have to realize that it's right it's wrong it's just it's not whatever you think put that aside and the yeah. solution might just, actually be to do this uh, gesture yeah. the small small gesture you know my, my advice to his sister is um finally if, if she can, if she wants to get in contact with my wife, because my wife's dad's obviously Algerian and obviously I've been married to my wife for well, four years now. And I've seen this, like when she was talking about these kind of things, I was like, Oh my God, my wife went through this and my wife, but Alhamdulillah, like, my wife's relationship with her dad was a bit rocky for a while, but she's recently really sort of rectified it and actually made it, mm. you know? And I think, you know, it would be good for sisters to talk to each other with this sort of stuff. Because I think the, the, the situation she's talking to, she's talking about is very similar. Like, I'm just seeing images of that. Um, and when you're talking about Algerian men, I'm seeing that because that's, you know, the only Algerian man I know, father I know. So, yeah, definitely get in touch with my wife, inshallah, and, and, and she'll advise you maybe mm. in a more personal way um, mm. about it because um, I think she'd be really able to benefit you. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. please do. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a really good uh, question, which maybe a lot of people will, you know, benefit from. I'm not saying these are like the absolute solutions or whatever, but it's useful, I think, to hear different opinions and approaches. And 
yeah, so uh, to try and uh, recap or summarize, uh, what you said, Muhammad, was like, we, we often view our parents as owing us something, but we need to yeah. perhaps focus on what we owe them, right? And that will yeah, put yeah. things into perspective. Then I also said, uh, you know, to start, you can start seeing your father as a victim. Just as you're a victim, he's also a victim because, you know, he may be getting sins for the harm he's doing to you. And also he might be acting this way because of some damage that's done to him, right? Yeah. Then I also said that you might do a nice gesture, like just doing what he would cherish, you yeah. know? Uh, whether you think it's right, wrong, you like it, you don't like it, it hurts your ego, it doesn't hurt your ego, just do that a little bit. And then I said, yeah, then I said, the, the first thing I said was to visit him and have that relationship with him as much as possible without that long-term damage mm -hmm. of you might wanting to just kind of cut it off. So, yeah, yeah. inshallah, that helps. And then uh, I guess we can put your wife's handle in the re response email so she yeah. kind of gets that. Cool, bro. I think we'll end cool. it there, inshallah. Yes, please, inshallah. Um, very good episode. Um, as usual, uh, you can, if you didn't know, this is on uh, audio, you know, all the podcast places, also on uh, YouTube, and the link is usually in the description of the podcast or whatever, so you can see it there. And if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, feedback, then go to mindheistpodcast.com where you can, uh, what can you do? You can find ways to contact us through email or anonymously. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jazakumallahu Khairan for listening. And yeah, Muhammad? Um, if there are any people that want to be, if any fans of Mind Heist that want to be a bit more deeper involved, you know, you want to be part of the part of Mind Heist, I don't know what you want to call it, it's not a movement. No, it's not really a movement. It's mm -hmm. just a thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, um, I want to do something with social media a bit more that I'm struggling to find time with. So if there's anybody interested, in being you know getting involved on the social media side of things um maybe just uh, maybe managing it maybe putting content up for us or or even editing um putting clips together or audio clips or whatever it is you know um because we do have social media out there and i only managed to update it when we put an episode out and sometimes i'll put up a video sort of thing but it's um Mm. it's kind of what's holding us back a little bit right yeah yeah yeah. and i know like, there's people out there and i that may want to and i'm i'm just putting it out there on the episode if anybody does then mm. feel free maybe even message me on whatever socials i've got mm. yeah, and, yeah and we can have a discussion see what opportunities yeah. are available yeah yeah ultimately if you think this is useful um even if you know obviously we don't always have the right ideas of course but the, the the idea i think with mind heist is that we're just hopefully exposing people to maybe things they didn't think of themselves um, yeah. and that's the idea basically so if you believe in that and you think it's like really beneficial and i guess if you benefited from it yourself in some form or another then yeah definitely get involved uh, because you can help us take it further like i looked at it muhammad a week or two ago and our downloads per episode are going up on average um, mm. but this kind of stuff of posting on social media and all of that, that would grow it at a much faster pace. Right. Yeah. So like we're inshallah committed to, you know, being consistent and this would take it to a new level inshallah. So yeah, yeah I think in touch. what, what it requires on social mm. media isn't something that I can maintain because I'm mm. not, I think I would have been able to a few years ago. Yeah. I'm so unplugged from social media now. Mm in that way like i'm not engaged in that way i just find it difficult to sit down and really put any engagement in but yeah mm. um yeah it's just a not a cry for help <laughs> it's just a, an opportunity i believe it's an opportunity yeah. for anyone who wants to get on board yeah. and then you'll get to know me and then me personally you know we'll be good friends <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Well, if a sister wants to uh, be the one to um, help out, then uh, well, can't you have can't to liaise be. with my my wife? Yeah, you have to liaise with my wife if if we go down that road. Yeah. But yeah, cool, bro. Uh, yes. So if you benefited, then maybe you can help benefit others. And with that, I will say, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Shadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Salaam wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.